<laughs> okay, so good morning and uh, happy uh, very rainy Friday, October 18th. Uh, Province-wide rounds um, is great. It's my real privilege today to present two people. First, the person who will present our presenter, and that's uh, Dr. Gaylene Hargrove. So she is the chair of our palliative care committee for the province and has done an outstanding job uh, corralling and developing a program of work, part of which includes uh, education and visiting speakers and uh, rallying uh, the people around the province to actually understand and implement uh, palliative care. Um, initiative. So uh, she comes from the Island World Jubilee Hospital. Uh, Gaylene, over to you. Thank you so much, Hadira. I'm deeply honored to introduce Manita Jossel. Dr. Jossel is currently a staff nephrologist uh, at the University Health Network in Toronto with an interest and passion in providing renal care to older folk. That was the preferred introduction. The rest of it you can read in the announcement. So without further ado, Dr. Jossel. Thanks. Am I actually being watched as well? Yeah. Oh, that's even worse. <laughs> okay. Um, so hello out there to everybody. Um, oh, oh yeah, okay. That's grand. So, um, yeah, so my name's Vanita, and, and um, I think any time I've come to BC before, I've done kind of like a researchy style talk, and I've talked about some of the research work I've been doing. I've decided it's because I'm getting old now. I, I don't do quite as much research. I can't always prove all of my thoughts quite as well, but I end up thinking an awful lot more. And so I decided to, to I was asked to talk about shared decision making, and I decided to name my talk Musings, Milestones, or Marketing. Um, for a very deliberate reason. I guess the title came to me very recently whenever I was down at the car showroom um, and getting our, the, the service desk and getting my car sort of serviced as routine and the service technician or whatever these fancy people are called tried to or convinced me to get nitrogen for my tires. So it was a very nice experience of shared decision making from a patient's perspective. I knew nothing about nitrogen. I knew nothing about tires. I felt that I was intelligent enough to listen to his um, arguments both in favor and against. And I thought I made a shared decision. Where what I realized was he had actually marketed me. He had actually marketed me. He had given me what he wanted me to respond, which of course was please supplement my technician services salary through selling you some nitrogen that's probably not worthwhile and that he had actually hit a milestone for having something that he wanted done and that this was really the way shared decision making was working for me and um, whenever I was speaking with my patients does this ring a bell at all do you ever feel that you walk in and you kind of know what you want the patient to choose and so I, I just thought that it would be fair for me to start to think a little around what was going on in my head. I, I'm not at all artsy-fartsy. I have no knowledge of the literature and all of those rich and wealthy things. I have no knowledge of the arts. But Pablo Picasso has been through Toronto on several occasions and been shown. And this, this picture always kind of amazed me. It's painted in 1937, and it's called The Weeping Widow. It's actually um, his his stuff on the side, um, Donna Marr or Dora Marr, who uh, he's painted on several occasions and it's called The Weeping Widow. It's a series of pictures that were inspired by a bombing of his home city um, by the Luftwaffe and the damage that was caused there. And, and the picture is supposed to represent this sort of dichotomy between the, what was going on and the suffering and the pain and anguish that he was seeing, but also some hope. Um, where, you know, the long lengthy hair that we see in this picture, the bird at the left ear was supposed to represent some degree of optimism. I like this to start off my presentation because it sort of reminded me a little bit of my era and my own personal career through shared decision making. I think I used to see it as being very black and white. I used to see it as being something that was concrete and well defined. 
There were, I could give information to my patient, my patient would interpret some of this information and would help lead me crystallized towards one particular thing. You know, this is a picture of a widow who's weeping. And then I realized that as I grew older and I grew a little more sort of introspective perhaps, or maybe I'd experienced patients' reactions towards me, and I suspect a lot of it was patients' reactions towards me, that I'd become much more colored and much more nuanced in my approach. And so this picture represents, I think, a lot of that nuance, a lot of that um, variability, and, and it allows you to sort of choose from it what you want. Does that make sense? Let me get back to science. I'm hoping that whenever we're talking with each other that, that we'll learn um, if there are different ways or approaches to apply our knowledge. Um, and, and this knowledge that we have of nephrology, this knowledge that we have of renal disease, to incorporate perhaps some of those comprehensive geriatric assessments that I'm very passionate about, but also then through that to really maybe reflect on the tools that we are using, to reflect on the predictors, the online dialysis modality calculators, those nice sort of protocols that we all follow, to perhaps get in touch with this concept of moral distress, less so around uncertainty and resilience, although I'm happy to talk about those, and then to see if we can come out of this with a different perspective on how to adapt care. How do we incorporate care for our patients into, into what I've termed um, palliative dialysis or palliative renal care? Uh, from my perspective and not from the, what we've named it before. So again, let's just think about what we do as doctors. What we do as doctors, as good doctors, is to really help to interpret the tests and the findings and to use our knowledge of medicine to be able to um, diagnose a patient, modify that course of our patient, but also to allow our patient to anticipate what that natural progression of disease whenever it's treated is particularly with chronic disease, and we're brought up to do something. I think that's an important thing for us to realize. We're brought up to do and not to be sometimes, not to do masterly in activity, as one of my staff doctors used to teach me. We're also burdened with this concept of responsibility for resources and resource allocation, and I think that influences a lot of times what we're doing and what we're thinking. And we're left with this... Um, background history of always practicing medicine with the view of beneficence and not maleficence. And I think that that puts an ethical component of what, on what we're doing. This happens to be my dad, not for any other reason, but while I was thinking about the talk, my dad called, and he's kind of cute in photographs. <laughs> <laughs> he's actually not sick. God bless him, he's not sick. It's just a very, very long way um, in the airport to go from one place to the other. And they find that they can bypass the queues a little bit if they sit in wheelchairs. <laughs> <laughs> That's very sad, and I won't say it out loud again. I'm thinking, though, of a patient, a case, uh, an 84-year-old man who has uh, come to clinic now with a history of hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, and chronic kidney disease. He's got a background of atrial fibrillation, a bit of cardiac disease. He had two cardiac events some time ago and was managed very appropriately with drug-eluting stents and has remained quite good uh, since then without any pain or symptoms. He's relatively well nourished. Serum albumin's 32. That's not bad in my hands anyway. And he's what I would call a stable old duck. Um, he's, he does all right. He's okay. He's managing around and seems to be very content and very happy. I have no idea why, but I have a weekly certificate that wants to come up every five minutes on my computer. Let's see if I can get this going. Actually, can't. Hmm. There we go. Now, in theory, a lot of the literature out there talking about shared decision making, and this is a relatively recent seminars in nephrology article, will talk about using precision medicine or individualized treatment, um, incorporating comorbidity and incorporating functional status into a choice between incremental dialysis, conservative management, or kidney transplant. And if you look at those pink boxes under, under all of those things, these are all very concrete, measurable um, factors that we're incorporating into disease. And the blue things are the things that we would adapt for our patient. And oftentimes, the adaptation is around making things shorter, making dialysis treatments shorter or less um, frequent. 
maybe just adapting something around what we perceive as what we think is going to alter the patient's health. And I think this sort of a model is perhaps a little, a little naive and a little um, non-specific for the patients. And I'm going to hopefully change your minds around this. Let's start first of all, I can point, can I? No, I can't. Let's start first of all thinking about, well, OK, if I'm going to look at, at dialysis therapies and try and discuss what the outcomes are for my patient, what sort of survivals do I have? And oftentimes, we're led to prognostic calculators. Do you routinely use prognostic calculators here? No? Some do, some don't. So it's very variable. I, I, I find that a lot of times our trainees, am I correct in this trainees, that you're taught to use the prognostic calculators or encouraged to use them? It's variable? OK. Phew. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I, I often, I will go to the prognostic calculators at times if I think that there's going to be um, something more litigious or families are very specific about stuff. But I, I think, you know, if you look at what the prognostic calculators do, they really incorporate a lot of information to help us to identify those at risk of early death or those at risk of early deterioration. If I take my older gentleman, my older patient, and I apply them through my prognostic calculators looking, for example, with six-month mortality and hemodialysis, using the surprise question that uh, Cohen uh, et al. have incorporated in there, then I can actually work out through this using the surprise question, would I be surprised if this patient died within the next six months? I can work out that he's probably got a 26% mortality risk were he to start dialysis immediately. Now, I think there's none of us who would be surprised if an 86-year-old dies. I think, I hate to say it for my own father, he's not quite 86, but, but you know, were he to die in the next six months, I probably wouldn't be surprised, upset, concerned, worried, whatever. Yes, but surprised at 86, I think, is not fair. And so 26 mortality percent mortality risk at six months is not something that, uh, that is unexpected here. If we look at other calculators, there's a more optimistic calculator using the French data, um, which is a nice, well-designed, large cohort study. They actually look at predictions over three years for patients. Now, their patients are possibly a little better than the patients we see in North America. Again, I don't have a pointer here. It's not working. But if you look, patients who, 47% of the patients um, can, can walk without any assistance. Only around 15% need assistance for transfers. And we see probably a, a lot more morbidity with that uh, than anything else. Again, if you look at what they can predict, they would be able to estimate an 86% um, chance that this gentleman would uh, survive, sorry, it would not survive three years. So a 14% chance of surviving three years. And if you look at their results, what they actually demonstrate for us is a nice splay of curves depending on what the scores are. I want you, however, to take a little bit more of a look at these curves. If you look at the lowest quintile, the patients who are the most vulnerable, what you can see, and again, I'm sorry I cannot point to it, is that there's a rapid fall off in survival in the first few months. But even if you take a cutoff of the first 100 days or a cutoff of the first one year, you're really ending up with proportions of a 50-50. So when I present to you, I've got a treatment where at one year you may or you may not be alive as a 50-50, I'm not really trying to convince you or trying to tell you what the challenges are with dialysis therapies. It's a 50-50. It's not really an easy thing to do. And, and the early mortality of 30% is perhaps not meaningful for my patient. Does that make sense? So the dialogue, as far as I see it, is based on the clinical evidence. I've got some concerns that were we to use dialysis as part of your care, there's a 50-50 chance of you being able to do well over the first 6 to 12 months. Well, I don't know. If I was buying nitrogen, they were saying to me it was 50-50 in terms of my tires having longer longevity for a small cost. I'm not sure I would be actually doing that. And I'm not sure which of the two I would choose. It would probably depend on whether it was raining or not, or whether I was wearing blue trousers rather than black. It's very random and very sporadic. And so I think we need to be doing more. 
Now, I'm a big proponent of comprehensive geriatric assessments. I think if any of the fellows have been with me on service, I ask some really bizarre questions which often relate to information gathered through these assessments. And more recently, there's been a really nice series of 193 patients who were assessed around the time of dialysis initiation, three weeks before to two weeks after, looking at what their geriatric components would be. Nice study, multi-centered, limited to the Netherlands population. They incorporated a ton of really nice, robust geriatric assessments. I've listed them here, but essentially what they did was they looked to see how the individual was performing in their own personal care environment, ADL, in their domestic and home environment, what you and I do as a family within our homes, depending on what our family structure is, their mobility in terms of how they're getting up, how they're walking around, People like me who fidget probably would do well. Depressive symptoms, because depression is a large component of what can happen as you age. Nutrition, which often is incorporated into frailty assessments, as well as their cognition and comorbidity. So a very comprehensive, broad assessment. They estimated somewhere between 60 and 90 minutes required for these assessments done over several occasions. They were actually very good. They also incorporated a range of, of frailty indices. We know frailty is a concept. We can recognize it often as clinicians, but it's a concept. And so measuring frailty has become really quite controversial. And while you and I as nephrologists are very familiar with the Freed Frailty Index, there are many other tools that can be used, depending on what you're really looking for. But essentially, it's to identify those people who are more at risk or more vulnerable to the impact of disease. It really is going back to the original definition where the recovery from disease is impaired because of generalized effects. So, you know, a one-day cold will cause a weak recovery or will result in a week's recovery. And they used some really nice tools here as well. So what did they find? Well, in their population, they found frailty and geriatric impairments to be relatively common. These are 70, uh, these are 193 patients aged 75 years on average, plus or minus seven years, so 65 or older. They found that patients had impairment in multiple domains, both ADL as well as IADL. Cognitively, if you used a test battery, somewhere in the region of 72% had some impairment. That's consistent with what we know because of vascular disease. But it didn't always show, and so, you know, on an MMSE, only 13% of the patients appeared to have abnormalities. So we're not always totally picking up on cognitive impairments. And they showed that if you use the, the surprise question, that there were very few people that you weren't surprised. We kind of touched on that point before. I think very few of us would be surprised if a 70-plus-year-old was, was to die. These are perhaps a little um, better patients than we would see starting dialysis in North America. Oh, I forgot I had done that. So functional <laughs> status and um, patients are quite impaired. MMSE assessment may not be the ideal thing. I think their frailty assessments show it's very, very common. And that in this population surprise question probably doesn't function very well. So very much those points. They presented the results as six-month mortality and one-year mortality. And what they were able to show with each one of these impairments was the relative risk of, of dying at six months. But if we look at that, actually, in a little bit more detail, I moved these around. So six-month mortality was around 8%. If we look at these in a little bit more detail, where's my slide? I'm so sorry. It's showing as it's not. Um, it's not presenting. Oh, there it is. Lovely. If we, should, if we look at these in a little bit more detail, what you can see is that the, that the mortality statistics, while the risk of death is much higher, let's say, in a frail patient compared to a non-frail patient, all of my labels have gone on this, and I apologize. I think I've done something wrong. You can see that of the 150 patients who, who were frail, only 15 died. So 90% of those patients who were identified as being high risk 
of mortality actually didn't die within the first six months. Likewise, if you took any of the other parameters, the, the risk of not dying within those first six months, even though that these were high-risk dyers, high-risk mortality individuals was actually quite, quite low if you were to compare them within their own group. And so in my mind, it leads to problems with us actually interpreting what exactly we're, we've got in front of us in terms of advising our patients. So at six months, the mortality rate was 8%. At 12 months, the mortality rate was 15%, perhaps a little lower than, uh, than we would see otherwise. Now, US data are perhaps a little more pessimistic than Netherlands data. And I think um, I often use these to describe what's going on for our patients when we're having a chat around mortality. This is a group of veterans patients. If you look at the, the columns with the red arrows there, the ones who are 80 years of age, because our patient is 84. If they've had any um, hospitalization process, if they've had any repair process, mortality rates are often three to six months, so survival process is six months. You can see that the wide range here represented by the confidence interval is really quite impressive. And so it can be anything from two months rather than through to Sorry. Uh, this is very interesting. Sorry, um, I, I think something has happened here in my process. And again, I'm getting all of these messages. In addition, the US data would suggest to us that many of our patients spend a lot of time in hospital. And that's probably um, something that we underrepresent medical work, <coughs> including uh, when we're talking to patients with shared decision making. So again, for the 80 to 84 year old patient, they can spend somewhere between 30 and 80 percent of their time surviving uh, in hospital, hospitalized for some acute reason for vascular access or otherwise. Oh, that's what the pull was. Thank you. I felt something important. Thank you. Is that better? Yeah. Beauty. Sorry, so I'm not sure when the mic came off, but it's probably good for you. You got a breath. <laughs> <laughs> so here's my conclusions from the data that we traditionally use in our shared decision making. So we can say to, to patients, you know, patients with frailty, some form of ADL impairments of an increased risk of death and hospitalization. The risks of death are probably 50-50 for a year, worst case scenario. The risk of hospitalization is 50-50 for the first year, worst case scenario. We know that patients with cognitive issues, depression or mobility are probably going to be a slightly higher risk than that, so identify that and we can tell them. But again, it's 50-50 worst case scenario. And while a lot of the papers, and I took this as a direct quote, would say that the use of online calculators and on comprehensive assessments let us better characterize the risk of early death and the risk of hospitalization. I would argue that that's actually not true. These calculators really just help us to identify those who are likely to do well, and that's relatively, relatively uncommon. Those who, are, who we are know for sure are likely to do well, those who we know for sure are likely to do well. So really, with all this information and the change that we've had over the last several years, I've been musing on the fact that the only change in my dialogue is that based on the clinical evidence, I have some concerns that were we to use dialysis, part of your care, there's a 50-50 chance of you doing well in the first six to 12 months. Nothing has really changed despite all of these assessments. Picasso, 1902, his blue period, that is how I felt. And so this actually led me to do a lot of thinking. And again, I drew from one of my patients. And I drew from one of my patients where I found that I didn't want to enter in to see this patient in their hospital room or in their dialysis unit location. I found that I had distress whenever I went in to see my patient because I felt that I had not done my best. I felt that this was something that was predictable. This was something that I had tried 
very hard to communicate. And this was something that caused me to feel I had dishonored the patient that I knew prior to initiation of dialysis. And so I spent a lot of time over the last years thinking about what that was and why did I experience these feelings. And actually there's a very strong literature on moral distress. And I find that that's probably one of the things that I draw on an awful lot more um, to help to guide some of our discussions. So let me tell you a little bit about moral distress. In 1984, it was recognized first in the nursing literature, and the nursing literature can sometimes be um, pertinent and very descriptive, but, but difficult to distribute, I think. The concept of moral distress, however, was well described because what they wrote about were these emotions or attitudes, if you want to call it that, where they felt that they had been doing something that was undesirable, they felt distressed by what actions they were taking. And they described actually different environments. They described interactions between staff. They described interactions between patients. They described treatments and things that they were actually doing. And this distress resulted in them having a negative action on their patient care. So this is like me not wanting to go in to see this patient. I actually used to sit outside and just look at the chart and make sure I would tick off all the things and write a little note as if I'd seen the patient. But I didn't want to walk in and have to watch that patient's face. So this, this was a negative um, impact on patient care. And moral distress has multiple different dimensions. Physicians tend to experience it whenever we feel that we've had some form of deceptive communication. We haven't fully disclosed things or we've been more optimistic. Nurses feel it whenever they're actually performing care, and I think that sort of fits with what we do with nurses, where they feel that some of the stuff that they're doing is futile, that's not appropriate, it's not of medical benefit. We see that a lot in the ICU. And so if we take that moral distress and we incorporate it into our world as nephrologists, perhaps rather than looking at this concrete dichotomy between survival or hospitalization, survival, not hospitalization, and death, we really need to look at what it is the patient expected. And here are where my musings start. I'm going to suggest to you that we should be using our knowledge in a completely different way. I'm going to suggest to you as clinicians, we are good about knowing what mortality and morbidity is for the individual. We actually understand an awful lot more about the disease trajectory. And perhaps if we use that knowledge, we'll be able to help to predict what symptoms our patient is going to have and how it's going to impact them. And then we're going to also be able to understand what that interaction is for them as individuals, but also what it's going to do for the caregivers and what the patient perceives their caregiver's nonverbal feedback to be, because don't forget that that's a very important feeling and, and well-being. I'm going to go back to dad here. 84-year-old man, CKD, has been doing pretty well. His clinical course he's seen three times a year, and Mickey C, you can see his labs there have been relatively stable, tends to attend with his family. My true patient is a European patient with a big family, so they just vary around who they're actually uh, coming to see him. There's been a gradual slowing overall, and what I've noticed is if I look properly and concretely, there's been a gradual grumbles in terms of weight loss. Just that gradual grumbles that you and I would accept as being aging. There's very few symptoms. Occasionally he has a bit of edema and responds well to furuzumide. You can probably see that in the fact that his bicarbonate goes up and down a little. I think it's with oral bicarb and a bit of uh, diuretics. And overall, he's had very little change in his labs. We're not giving him EPO, so we're not overdoing it, by the way. So if I use my professional knowledge, I just finished nephrology interviews, and I think three out of the interviewees talked about the AEIOU when they would start dialysis. It was quite funny that they brought out these acronyms. I'd never heard of it before. If I look and I think about my professional knowledge, I actually can identify for this particular gentleman that it's most likely that the fact that he has some mild, moderate chronic ankle swelling, that his presentation that would trigger me to thinking about dialysis may be either fluid overload, which seems to be responding at the present time, or possibly because of this sort of sarcopenia that I'm beginning to see if he were to present with something which suggested to me a test disturbance. Those two things are going to be key knowledge from my perspective. I think the other piece of knowledge that's going to be, whoa, I'm so sorry, it's because of this.
constant desire to change my settings, my computer coming up. The other thing that we also know is that he's already got the grumbles. He's already showing some frailty characteristics, and so his health trajectory is probably going to be that of the frailty trajectory. These are common trajectories that you and I know within the geriatric literature. It's likely that what's going to happen is he's going to slowly deteriorate. There are going to be a couple of small instances where he has an illness. There's going to be a rapid decline in that function, that well-being, which we may be able to return somewhat back towards that baseline, but that baseline is already beginning to shift in the downward, the downward manner towards the dying process. And you know, maybe there'll be a bigger shift in one or two of these with a bit of a chronic disease trajectory overlying this. So armed with that knowledge and the knowledge of our patient, if we also incorporate what dialysis would offer for this gentleman, we'd actually understand that on top of these grumbles, on top of these very minimal symptoms, we would be offering him a treatment that would likely lead to more functional impairment. The one on the that must be your left, um, is DOPS data that we published which showed that prevalent dialysis patients have high burdens across every country. It's every age group. The one on the right hand side is from peritoneal dialysis uh, populations, again showing the same sort of thing. I think in Japan there's a lower um, functional impairment likely because of their selection criteria. And we know that this Decline in function is going to occur quite early in the disease course. So with that medical knowledge, if we turn to what our patient really wants to know, now we need to, to glean a little bit of what's going on. It is true there was one particular time that the Maple Leafs did actually beat a team. It has been known to happen. <laughs> so goals. Goals are something that I think are probably most important. And I think this is where maybe our, our musings and our, and our changes need to occur. I think we need to have much more of a concrete idea about exactly what it is the patient expects short term from us in terms of what they can improve, intermediate term and long term. And so I'll often ask the patients around that. Let me just give you an example again. If I go back to my patient, I like this diagram because it describes his life space. This is a very dynamic patient, a very dynamic 84-year-old who travels internationally. He was last in Italy in December 2018. He's a very high fall risk. He's got a somewhat unstable gait after some previous spinal surgery. And so he has this predisposition towards falling, and that's particularly important in the dialysis literature. His family talks about him having some degree of cognitive slowing. He's no longer doing the crossword quite as quick as he was before. He doesn't partake in the newspaper or in political discussions as he did before. And he has a very strong mistrust of strangers being anywhere close to his home. He had a couple of episodes where a roofer actually diddled him and stole some stuff. There's been a couple of robberies in the house. And so he's been a victim of home invasion and repair scams. He's, he's quite suspicious. Uh, pertinent, I think, for peritoneal dialysis. And if you look at his family, he relies very heavily on his wife, but she's having difficulty lifting pots and pans, which in my mind really is very pertinent for peritoneal dialysis because the bags are somewhat the same weight as a pot or a pan. So this really allows me to shift my discussion, moving from the traditional model where we're saying you've got a 50-50 risk, you know, do you want life extension with probably some hardship and poor quality of life, or a shorter life with better quality of life, to a much more informed discussion using our knowledge. I know that he will likely present with overload or fatigue and cachexia. I know that his mortality risk where he to start dialysis is close to a quarter in the first six months. His survival is around two years, and he has a, lot, a likely high risk of functional cognitive change over the first year. If I supplement that from his perspective, I can tell that he's got a high falls risk with early cognitive changes. He doesn't like strangers. He's quite good at changing his routines and sticking to diets. He likes to sit and eat at the table, so he needs to have sitting balance. That's a real value for him. He needs to have sitting balance for grooming and dressing. And while he likes walking outdoors and doing the current park, he can live without that. 
So now my conversation with him is much more informed. Yes, if I initiate you with dialysis, I might be able to make your less, legs less swollen. They'll be less heavy whenever you're walking around. But I think you're going to be more fatigued. I think you're going to need to engage much more with occupational therapy and physiotherapy to keep your mobility going because of this ongoing fatigue. And this is likely to impact your ability to go and get the milk and go to the park. On the other hand, if I'm using a comprehensive conservative renal care, I might be able to offer you a slightly shorter life, but I think I'm going to less dramatically have a treatment that impacts on your ability for the things that you're doing. I think whenever things are impacted, it's going to be the final days, and I'll be able to provide you with some in-home support for nursing care and medical care. And again, remembering that that's likely when he will be less aware of strangers being in the house. Talking with the gentleman, when it came towards the time when we would have wanted to start dialysis, his complaint was, can you relieve the breathlessness, his short-term goal, so then I can sleep in bed at night? Very distinct short-term goal. Can you make my legs lighter so I can lift them into the bed without having some help? Very succinct short-term goals. His medium-term goal was to be able to use that lighter legs to be able to partake in physiotherapy. This guy had a long history of being an exerciser, and so he was terribly gung-ho for that. And then I'd be able to return home by myself or with my wife's support. Now again, we can use our knowledge from hemo rehab outcomes. Uh, we actually recently did get this published, showing that if you partake in rehab around the time of dialysis, you can improve some of that mobility. And so his desire for his long-term or his medium-term goal is achievable, even if we were to use dialysis. And while it's not published for the PD literature, I think that that's likely the same. In PD, however, we also know that patients who are frail or pre-frail have a high risk of requiring support or help, either from a nurse or from their, their loved ones in the home for providing the PD. Now we found it not to be well correlated with the amount of help that was required, but at least we can predict the degree of help. And in fact, if anything, we can also predict the tasks that the other person would have to manage. And so again, using this information, this medical information may help support the family. Here, his wife cannot lift pots and pans. And we know that often it's the lifting of the bags and the discarding of the bags that is a task that has to be performed by the family members. So it may be a barrier. We know, and this is as yet unpublished from our series, that even as patients go through their trajectory of peritoneal dialysis, that this amount of care that they require from the caregiver doesn't get less and doesn't change. And so that would also be information that would help them to determine what's going on from their perspective and what they would need to do. And we know that life space changes are very highly likely for this gentleman. It is unlikely that he will be able to maintain his life, his life space as unlimited, and he's much more likely to be restricted to the neighborhood and to and from clinics. So now I feel my musings have altered my discussion with my patient. I can use any of my shared decision-making techniques, whether it's ask, tell, ask, whether it's a structured, serious conversation, illness guideline, or I'm beginning to favor much more the best case, worst case scenario discussions. I can now engage my patients using things that are actually customized to this individual that actually relate to their moment to moment, day to day interactions. Offering a treatment with hemo or peritoneal dialysis that would definitely require much more participation in physiotherapy even when they're feeling exhausted that would lead to them having probably to purchase some assistance for lifting bags if they were to choose peritoneal dialysis, or to getting a nurse coming in as a stranger coming in. I can really speak much more towards fall risk and cognitive loss, and I can describe these things specific to their day-to-day -day and the things that are important to them and not as generalized things. At the same time, what else do I do whenever I'm using my atypical palliative approach towards renal care? I must admit I'm also reminding them that not only if they start dialysis, 
they also can stop dialysis. And I actually, with every single patient, regardless of age, will introduce this concept of them having permission to stop. And I know dialysis withdrawal or discontinuation is something that's of interest. But I start with that conversation before we've even initiated dialysis therapies. I now prescribe to the symptoms. So my, my hemodialysis treatments or my PD treatments are actually prescribed to the symptom and not necessarily to the standard three times a week or four hour durations. And that may mean dialysis on a daily basis, it may mean a slower, longer dialysis rather than just the shorter ones. And I realign my treatments constantly with the goals that the patient is actually uh, expressing at the time. My musings, it's quarter past eight, I think it's around time that I have some discussion. I think we need to identify our own moral compass I'm hoping that I can show you why the geriatric assessment maybe allows us to titrate or to tailor our conversations for patients so that then it's much more about understanding their perspective. It's not necessarily giving them a choice only, but understanding that with their choices, how would this actually impact their treatment from our perspective. And I think we need to be able to align our treatments much more towards what specific goals they are likely to um, require. I'm going to leave it there and take questions. That's too many musings. If I take this off. Open for discussion or I can repeat your question, yeah. Um, so I, I find that there are, maybe you can comment whether there's something we can do with two different sets of patients. There are patients who seem to gradually progress with their symptoms very slowly and we can manage them. And there are other people who, in spite of all our conversation, present very acutely, short of breath, unwell. And those are the people who end up on dialysis when maybe they didn't want to. They, and so I, I don't, I still, to this day, I think I'm going to retire not knowing what to do with the because they're uh -huh. different, and and uh, I don't know. I think it's a physiologic difference. It isn't how we approach them. We see them often. Um, do you have any thoughts about that and how we could manage those people who are crashing? And I do actually, and I'll tell you because that again, it's been these acute starts. I've had a few um, situations where did I do that? <laughs> My stomach this morning at 3 in the morning. <laughs> I'm a Toronto timer, right? Um, so actually, I, I think that's been one of the things that's been very distressing for me. I've had patients, uh, we, our, our Mickey C um, clinic has green charts. For some reason, we've green file files. Um, and one of the things we did as an initiative was to change those people who had definitely conclusively chosen a comprehensive conservative uh, care pathway into yellow charts. So we call them yellow charters. But I often, everybody starts off as a green chart. Um, and I often have patients who have been green charters that I know are likely to become yellow charters. We haven't quite got there and we haven't got that concrete answer. And I think these are the people who are very, who are very vulnerable, who are going towards um, you know, a, a more comprehensive approach and, and a much more palliative approach, but yet they haven't quite made it there and they crash start. And so I've, spent, I've had a few of those cases and I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. Now, again, what I do is I'm very explicit with my patients and my patients' families about disease trajectories. And I actually will sit down often with a piece of blank paper and draw out this particular trajectory. And what I actually do, I'm going to walk, sorry. <laughs> what I actually do is I place their um, level of functioning closer to where they are on that y-axis. So I will say, this was where you were when you were, you know, doing such and such a thing. And I'll anchor it to a particular event. When you went to Italy last year, I've just noticed that this is the decline. And you've been in hospital three times. And I'll put in those drops. And again, I will match it to their specific medical trajectory. 
My concern is that I know that this is what we tend to see, and I worry, and I draw in the bottom half of that, I worry that we're on this trajectory. My issue is I don't know if you are, and I will point then to, let's say, close to where I've got the word time, for those of you who can't see me, um, I'll point there, I don't know if we're there and you're likely to recover, or whether you're going to actually come in next time and you're closer here, and no matter what I do, you're not going to be able to recover. And so it's probably important for us to think about this in a different way, because if you have that illness, I'm not sure that dialysis is going to fix whatever that was that caused that illness. And so I will then start to link the dialysis to the pneumonia. I'm not going to fix the pneumonia if you come in with pneumonia just because I've started dialysis. The pneumonia is telling me that your body is too weak to be able to manage things. And so I actually had that conversation earlier. Now it's backfired on me a couple of times because I, I think sometimes you can have it too early and sometimes it's not early enough. I think I'd much rather have it backfire than I would have not anticipating this acute drop. And so I'm sometimes using that in those situations. And now a couple of times I've found patients who have had that conversation with me, they've been cross, they've been upset that I'm having it. When they do crash start, they recognize it. And when I go there to actually have a conversation with the family, they will say, I now understand what you meant. And so that makes it easier. Does that help? Right, right. I think it's slowly changing. I'm looking there because we have one of our UHN people in the audience. Um, but I think it's slowly changing it because I, I will encourage people not to use the, the, use the statement, you now need dialysis because there is no time whenever you need it. Um, th this is a time when I would consider dialysis. And then I would actually, again, I try and anchor what the dialysis is going to do. This is a time whenever, you know, I would now consider dialysis to help some of that swelling in the legs. I'm unlikely to be able to treat the whatever with the dialysis treatment, so that's going to continue on. But this is why I'm talking about it now. And, and, and I would try and mitigate some of that. Now, if they present with hyperkalemia, so my CCRC patients who present with hyperkalemia, and I'll get you know a very enthusiastic and well-meaning PGY1 at, at you know 10 at night saying, well you need dialysis to fix the hyperkalemia. I think that becomes a bit of a problem. So I again will try and, and mitigate that by saying you know you might come into hospital with the potassium, and the, the resident will say to you, you need the dialysis, but all that's doing is going to take away the potassium. It's not taking away what's caused the problem. And so I will do that at an earlier stage. Does that make sense? That, that's my own perspective. I'm not sure if it works everywhere. Other people? Hi, Vanita. Hi, it's Sunit over at uh, VGH. So um, one thing I've always been interested in is the uh, discordance between understanding of what trajectory is. Um, and so we always focus on these studies that ask doctors, would you be surprised? And of course, our answer is always, or majority of time is no. Has anyone actually ever asked those same patients, would they be surprised if they died in the last six months? Because I think a lot of people, um, even though they have many comorbidities that are life-limiting before they come to see us, have no idea that they're likely to die. I think more and more people are thinking that they'll live longer and longer and longer. So um, I'm just wondering if there's any actual studies that ask patients if they'd be surprised. And secondly, um, in terms of symptom management, I think that um, generally in nephrology, we've really been poor at understanding what symptoms improve with dialysis or not. I think fluid overload and hyperkalemia and those things, obviously, we can manage on dialysis. But you know, having two parents who are octogenarians, both of them have fatigue, cachexia, and anorexia, even though the creatinines are under 100. So are we actually really realistic to patients? If they come in complaining of fatigue and loss of appetite and weight loss, is that really something we're going to fix on dialysis? Um, I'm, I'm trying to work out in my head how politically correct I need to be in a different province from my own. Not at all. <laughs> 
So the answer to your first question, has anybody ever looked at what patients' anticipation of their life expectancy is compared with um, ours? There has been a study, and I cannot for the life of me, due to aging, who the author in the year is. I, I'd like to say it's due to aging, but maybe it's due to bulk of having read, read stuff. But there is one, and it does not correlate well at all. And so your point is actually very valid. Now, I think in part some of that is our own problem, because when was the last time you said to your patient, you have chronic kidney disease, this is a very serious illness? It's almost as bad. No, actually, fair enough, it's probably worse than cancer. When was the last time has anybody ever used that? So I, I must admit, I, don't, I, I am obsessed by it. I am totally obsessed by it. I don't use it all the time, and I don't use it maybe as well as I should do. But, but, but it's actually quite an effective thing to say. And I will quite often say it to the caregiver and not the patient when the caregiver and the patient are in the room together, because I will then say to the caregiver, you know, this chronic kidney disease is pretty serious. Um, I really do worry about people like this, and I often find that they can't manage the things that you expect of them. It's almost, it's almost worse than cancer in terms of some of the things I see. And then I'm saying it to the family member so that then they back off about, he doesn't go and get the milk for me anymore, or whatever it happens to be. That's where I started that from. But, but it also is a nice passive way of not necessarily saying to the patient, you're toast, um, it, which is really what you're trying to, you know, yeah. So that's the first. The second question you had said was around um, the symptom management and which symptoms um, are, are best are best managed by dialysis. And actually, one of the things I really, when I was involved with ORN, let's not go there. When I was involved with ORN, one of the things that I really, really wanted us to be doing as nephrologists was to write down why we were starting dialysis. When I start a blood pressure pill, when I start amlodipine hypertension, I actually specify the blood pressure was 160 over 70, and therefore I would like to initiate amlodipine. When I am starting Tylenol, when I am starting prednisone in a lupus patient, I actually specify why I'm starting the drug. And so we do not do that for dialysis. It's nebulous. I'm just starting dialysis. If it is for a creatinine, we need to say, I am starting dialysis because the creatinine number looks so high, I feel shitty, because definitely my patient doesn't necessarily know that that creatinine is high. When I'm starting at hyperkalemia, I am starting dialysis for hyperkalemia that you do not feel that makes me think, because of my medical knowledge, that you are likely to have an arrhythmia that will make you die. If I specify that to myself, I think I would better understand what I'm doing with dialysis. And I think the only thing that we actually manage with dialysis that a patient experiences, well, death, um, from their hyperkalemia, but they experience overload and they experience the abnormal taste. Everything else, I am not sure that we improve. And so long as we do not acknowledge why we start dialysis, so long as we don't write it down, I think we will not be able to modify it. And I think it's critical. I know whenever I'm stopping dialysis, we'll also go back and see what was it that prompted me to start so that then I can understand how the stopping is going to affect this patient and what their experience of stopping is going to be. Does that make sense? I talk too much. No, can I ask a, a, a sort of a carry-on question? The notion of incremental dialysis, um, you know, why, to your point, so you don't have a lot of symptoms, we don't like the numbers, so now you go from zero to Mach 1. You go from no dialysis to three times a week, your whole life changes, or, you know, um, dialysis every night for PD. So what is the uptake in Ontario, Toronto, and what are the methods that you've used? Because I would think that from a um, cognitive and social perspective, it might be easier to convince people to start once a week, then twice a week, then three times a week, if in fact, you know, you're trying to ease them into it. Or maybe not. You know, I think it's, I don't know what to, yeah. you know, what are your thoughts on that? So I think my adduct academic productivity is so low because I spend a lot of time thinking about these sorts of things. I'm not sure incremental PD is actually, or incremental dialysis is actually right. I actually think it needs to be symptom driven. We need to state very clearly that I am dialyzing you because this is a bridge towards transplantation. I don't care how you feel. My job's just to get you to a transplant. So if you feel shitty, you turn up and you do your four hours and this is how we're doing it and you're going to stick to that diet because you're going to do it for transplant. 
If I am treating you because you are a destination dialysis, depending on what your expectancy, life expectancy is, your hospitalization experience is, I am treating you for your symptoms. This is a palliative intervention in this situation. And so I'm not sure incremental dialysis is appropriate. And I go back to one particular elderly lady that got sent to me by one of the other nephrologists, probably too late for me to really bond with her. She was very dynamic, but she had a six-month history of sarcopenia, frailty, and anorexia. And I could not, because I'd not met her before, tell if this was geriatric aging or whether this was uremia. I really had no good sense of her and what was going on. And so we did a bit of shared decision making with much less information than I could give her. And we elected to start dialysis. And our system in Toronto is such, I have to give up my patients so someone else would manage the care. And although I said, my thought is we should dialyze the shit out of this lady and see if she will actually improve her symptoms, and then we know to pull back. Um, she went on to what, what I would call incremental dialysis. And as a result of incremental dialysis, we still to this day do not know if she could or would have improved. She died very soon afterwards. But it was unclear to me, I mean, she probably died at four months or so. Um, but it was unclear to me whether I could have dialyzed the uremia away or if this was age related. So I'm not sure incremental is correct. The same way that I increase your azathioprine or decrease your azathioprine, depending on what I am seeing your lupus activity is doing, I should, I should be adjusting dialysis to what's going on. If you want to eat a bag of chips every day, maybe I just need to give you more dialysis for that. If you, like my patient, are able to manage a diet restriction, maybe I can do the once a week and allow you to have a compromised life. So I'm not sure that I totally have bought into incremental dialysis. Too much thought, not enough productivity. Sorry, and I think that's sort of how we think about um, our incremental dialysis so from a PD perspective. So we have a lot of patients who come to us with volume overload, and they do fine with an I could extra an overnight, ICO? and they're yeah. you know 85, and I don't really care if their creatinine is 300 or yeah. 400. Or their phosphate is 2.2. Yeah, that's okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so, so I think I think our, our view, Adira's probably saying the same thing you're saying, that maybe more than incremental, we try to individualize the, the dialysis right. prescription, and perhaps that's a better terminology. Um, yes, one question about, and I think more with hemo than with PD, with dialysis initiation and then stopping. So the concern that I have at some level that has been raised is if we start hemodialysis, I negatively impact your residual renal function, totally. and I potentially, by starting dialysis and stopping, accelerate your trajectory to death. Right. Um, I'm not sure I have the same concerns on PD, but maybe that's just because I'm a PD guy and I'm naive. Um, thoughts on that? No, totally. I, I think that Ra Rachel said that to me actually at the World Congress when it was here in Vancouver, and I think it was one of it was a life-changing comment that she made at the time. I think totally. We, we remove any of the chances whenever we start them on to hemo for them to discontinue and do okay. But that's part of my discussion. That's part of my discussion. I think you're absolutely right. I think PD is really what I try and push all older people onto PD. I try and not use necessarily assisted PD because I think that leads them to have a sick roll and then they feel that their life has been invaded. Or the same way I hate waiting for the bellman to come to my home. They spend every day doing that. So I don't... I don't necessarily use an assisted approach unless I really need to or they, they request it or maybe, you know, maybe the assistance is for the other aspect of their life. But I think you're absolutely right. It's really going back to what am I improving? What are you going to feel is different? And you're not going to feel the creatinine is different. I, I will have that conversation actually with relatives. I think we need to initiate dialysis. Or today is a day whenever I would consider starting dialysis because the lab results have become the, uh, come to a point where I'm uncomfortable watching this. I know that that might make me feel better because I think this risk may or may not be improved by that. It may actually make you feel a little worse because I'm going to be doing this and this and this. But that's kind of the decision that I need you to help me with. And that's actually the way I would sometimes express it. Am I treating myself 
which is a creatinine, a potassium, a bicarb, or am I treating my patient, which is overload, dyskusia? I can't think of anything else. Time's up. Thank you so much, Vanita. And um, I feel like we had a very productive discussion and um, has provoked more musings as we all get older. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Did it work? Yeah.